Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Akkad and Koka Report. I'm Michelle Akkad in San Francisco. Unfortunately, Dr. Koka is unable to join us. Our topic today uh, deals with one of the most fundamental questions that a doctor may be asked to answer. Namely, is this man or that woman dead? One would think that any issue or controversy regarding the, de the determination of death would feature prominently in the medical curriculum and in basic medical textbooks. Instead, those discussions and debates have been relegated to narrow spe specialty medical and philosophical journals so that most practicing physicians are remarkably unaware about our state of knowledge on this question. And I speak from experience here. With me today is Professor Alan Schumann, whose decades of well-documented clinical observations and reflections are of the utmost importance in regard to the determination of death particularly when death is legally established on the basis of neurological criteria, so-called brain death. Dr. Schumann is Professor Emeritus of Pediatric Neurology from UCLA, where he was on faculty since 1981 until his semi-retirement in 2013 or so. He began his academic career with a keen interest on the clinical problems of consciousness and coma, and, and coma and soon became one of the world's foremost defenders of the concept of brain death. By the mid-1990s, however, his clinical observations, meticulously documented and ultimately published in major journals of neurology, caused him to do an about-face and become firmly convinced that these criteria used to legally determine the death of a patient do not, as a fact of biology, testify to the death of a human being. While Dr. Schumann's work Schumann's work was initially met with some skepticism, a worldwide community of neurologists, scientists, and ethicists, who until then had unequivocally supported the concept of brain death, have been forced to confront what is now known in those circles as Schumann's challenge. Alan Schumann, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's, um, it's probably the case that most um, uh, most people in the audience, um, maybe in the situation uh, that I found myself in uh, a few years ago in 2013, uh, when I first became interested in the question of brain death. Uh, and that means that I maybe, maybe vaguely knew that there was some controversy um, about the brain death question. It didn't really preoccupy me that much. Um, as a cardiologist, I would be asked to sign death certificates and I would do it without thinking too much about it, you know, on, on the basis of brain death. Um, um, and, um, and that's, uh, that's about it. But, you know, if you think about it, it's a fundamental question and there ought to be some, uh, hopefully some certainty or more certainty about it than there actually is. And in 2013, December 2013, um, I was personally um, uh, taking a course in philosophy and the story of uh, Jahai McMath uh, came on the news and uh, I decided to um, focus my term paper um, using uh, her case as, you know, to, to direct my, uh, my research. And then I, I realized all the, the controversy um, that had to do with brain death that came to the fore in the news uh, at the time so that uh, I think by now there is the public is probably more aware of the controversy regarding brain death than they were before that case um, um, you know be, became public and was in the news um, and and then I discovered that there was a, a vast amount of medical literature uh, surrounding the controversy and then surrounding your work uh, that had been going on for you know, uh, 10, 15 years that most doctors were unaware of. Uh, certainly I wasn't. And, uh, and so I'm delighted to, to have you uh, here with us to, to clarify a little bit uh, your contribution and, and, and its meaning, um, recognizing that uh, other authorities uh, in the field will have a difference of opinion about what, what it means that you've discovered. Sure. But can you tell us a little bit what uh, your, your journey uh, clinically and intellectually on this question of brain death? Right. Well, my journey began, I suppose, as a neurology resident when, when I was taught that uh, brain death is a way of diagnosing death. Uh, 
and I was taught how to diagnose it according to the criteria that existed at that time. And uh, as a uh, philosophically minded neurologist, it wasn't enough for me just to follow the algorithm and diagnose it, but I wanted to know why is this condition death and not simply a deep coma. Right. So I began to read all the literature about it uh, during my uh, early days as an assistant professor. And uh, I, I learned a number of uh, interesting things that in retrospect kind of sowed the seeds for my eventual about face. Uh, one of those interesting things was that the, the concept of brain death as death was introduced in 1968 by the Harvard Ad Hoc Committee. And if you read their paper, uh, first of all, the title of the paper is a definition of irreversible coma. Right, not, not, not death. Not, not death. Right. Uh, and of course, if the brain is totally destroyed, then someone is in an irreversible coma. Uh, there's nothing mysterious about that. But to equate that condition with death itself was a huge leap of the Harvard committee. When you read the, the paper, it doesn't give any justification whatsoever for equating irreversible coma with death other than utility. Mm -hmm. so they saw it as a means for um, not filling up ICUs with uh, patients with destroyed brains who were on ventilators. Um, they saw it as a means for legally disconnecting ventilators from such patients. I guess at that time, the ethics of discontinuing life support was not as clear as it is now. Okay. Um, and of course, we don't need brain death to be death in order to discontinue a ventilator. Right, but that right. Time, they, they proposed that as a reason for defining this as death. Um, and then, of course, transplantation uh, would be facilitated if these patients were dead and not simply comatose. Right. And that was explicitly mentioned in that paper, if I recall. I mean, you know, those, those two reasons uh, of utility. Yeah, One absolutely. is to, to say, not only save ICU time, but they, I think they, they mentioned that uh, they didn't want to distress uh, families um, about their loved ones, you know, with, um, by having them hope for the inevitable. Um, and, and therefore, it was, it was, uh, there was value to the family in knowing soon enough that the patient was indeed dead or quote unquote dead. Right. So, so regardless of how many of these uh, justifications uh, you glean from the paper, uh, they were all uh, utilitarian. So there, there was no philosophical argument why this condition is death. Right. Because, uh, I mean, that that's, uh, seems to be like a valid question because on the surface, uh, it, it's a body that typically has a spontaneous heartbeat, right? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the brain that, the, the patient who's now declared brain that, you know, would have a spontaneous heartbeat, is warm, has all the um, usual features that we, associate, that we associate with life. Yes, exactly. Uh, what it doesn't have spontaneous is breathing, of course. Right. And and movement. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's curious that um, someone who meets all the criteria for brain death except for one cranial nerve reflex is considered irreversibly comatose but alive. Mm -hmm. And if you take away that cranial nerve reflex then all of a sudden they're dead. Right. Curious indeed. Sure. But um, 
So the Harvard criteria were, were, were published in uh, 1968. That was the first iteration of neurological criteria to declare someone. Uh, at the time, they used the term irreversibly comatose, but then it became brain death. Um, what's happened next historically? So uh, historically, uh, what happened next was a domino effect um, in the state legislatures. So beginning with Kansas and I think it was 1971, uh, state after state started introducing uh, neurologic criteria in their statutory definitions of death, uh, primarily in order to facilitate transplantation. Right. And as, as you know, as a cardiologist, in, in 1968, Christian Barnard did the first heart transplant. And and there was this uh, kind of rush of academic centers everywhere to do as many transplants as possible. Uh, so they really needed a legal uh, framework for uh, justifying taking vital organs from these patients. Right. Um, Christian Barnard's um, heart transplant, the donor was... Um, is that declared dead in that was in South Africa, of course. But what um, do you know what the, the legal context was there? Yeah, interestingly, um, the, the donor was declared brain dead, um, but Barnard uh, waited for the heart to stop after disconnecting the ventilator okay. because there was no legal precedent for this. So, so. After the heart stopped, he declared the patient dead according to ordinary criteria and then uh, removed the heart. Okay. But anyway, so, um, so the next milestone in the history of brain death was 1981, when uh, by that time, uh, a number of states, I think maybe 13 states, had uh, introduced brain death as legal death, but there still wasn't any philosophical justification for why this should be death. Uh, so I like I like to call this a conclusion in search of a justification. Right. Uh, so the Harvard committee started the conclusion, and people were scrambling to really find a justification. And now, now it was very important to find a justification because this is now legal death in 13 states. And, and so uh, the President's Commission was formed and came out with their uh, monograph in 1981, mm -hmm. uh, defining death. And they made the argument that uh, this condition is death because the brain is the master coordinator of the body. And without that neurological integration, the body is no longer a unified organism, but rather a collection of organs. Right. Uh, and interestingly, that same year, 1981, uh, Jim Burnett and uh, his colleagues uh, came out with a very important paper in seminars of neurology, uh, also making the same point that the brain is the master coordinator of the body. Uh, without his integrating function, the body literally disintegrates. Right. That's why brain death is death, according to them. So uh, 1981, both the President's Commission and Bernat, Culver, and Gert uh, came out with this rationale. Right, and and if I recall, in th those documents, uh, certainly in the in the the Presidential Commission's uh, document, there was language to the effect that um, the intensive care is masking the true reality of disintegration. Yes. Um, uh, number one, number two, that the disintegration was just a matter of time. That uh, you know, it's a process that was begun, that uh, the intensive care was perhaps slowing it down, masking it, but it was just inevitable. 
that the dissolution of the body would take place um, sooner or later. And as you said, and that, uh, and the, the biological um, uh, reason invoked was that the brain is the master integrator. It's the brain that holds the entire body together. And with total destruction of the brain or total lack of brain function, that uh, integrative capacity is no longer there. And as you said, there's a, a collection of, of cells and a collection of organs that is uh, on its way to dissolution. Right. Now, in uh, kind of in parallel with with this rationale, there was another school of thought which uh, essentially reduced the person to conscious brain activity. And uh, this school of thought argued that brain death is death because it involves irreversible loss of consciousness. And without consciousness, there's no more person. And therefore, if the person is no more, then the person has died. Right. And it doesn't really matter what the condition of the body is. And, and therefore, it makes a, that argument makes a distinction between a human being and a person. That's right. Uh, Right, because then they, they argue that you can be a human being but not be a person if you don't have consciousness. Yes, yeah. Um, so there, there were these two schools of thought, essentially, at that time. Right, the dominant one, I would say, uh, if, I, if I've read the, the Presidential Commission's report uh, correctly, was the, inter the, the brain as integrator. Um, yes, and the, the President's Commission rejected the, the uh, so-called higher brain death uh, theory. Okay. Uh, because that would include not only brain death, but uh, people in persistent vegetative state. Sure. Uh, and sure. anyone sure. with the irreversible coma, uh, not necessarily with the whole brain destroyed. Correct. Correct. So there you are. Uh, uh, I guess uh, in those days, a resident in 1981, were you uh, or, or entering your academic uh, career? No, I began my academic career in 1981. Okay. As an assistant professor at UCLA. Right. And um, so reading all of the literature, I, I was convinced that uh, this, this made sense, uh, that the, the brain does uh, perform wonderful integrative functions in the body. Uh, and the brain is the seat of consciousness. And, and actually both kinds of arguments appealed to me. Uh, I even wrote a paper in 1985 uh, arguing the higher brain death rationale. Right. Uh, based, on a, based on a thought experiment. So meaning that, that uh, uh, people who have who continue to have um, some brain function that allows them to breathe and uh, maybe have uh, sleep-wake cycles, that sort of thing, but who are otherwise unresponsive, have you know, maybe widespread destruction of the, of the cortex and don't seem to be conscious on the surface, that those people in a way are, would, be, would be dead. Um, yeah, that's what I argued in that paper. Okay. Um, so... I guess the, the next thing that happened in my journey was um, I was uh, invited to be a consultant for the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1989. And this was their second working group on the topic of brain death. Okay. So uh, by that time, I had um, jettisoned the higher brain death idea because I had come across examples of patients who had no cortex but who were clearly conscious. Okay. So these, these were chil uh, children with congenital uh, hydranencephaly. So they had intact brain stems, uh, thalamus and diencephalon, but no cortex. So according to neurological theory, 
they should be in a permanent vegetative state. Uh, nevertheless, these children uh, interacted with the environment in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they could see, they, they could scoot around rooms avoiding uh, objects by visual guidance. Um, they showed emotional responses to changes in the mood of music. Uh, right. Quite amazing. Could, it, could the case be made that they would have, they might have a remnant of cortex or sufficient cortex that, uh, that these um, um, sensory functions could take place? Uh, well, if, if you want to posit that all of these uh, functions can take place in a few neurons somewhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> floating uh, at the uh, margin of the skull, but uh, no, uh, okay. you, you, couldn't, you couldn't explain this uh, except that uh, their consciousness was mediated subcortically. Okay. Uh, so uh, when I encountered these children, uh, that kind of pulled the rug out from under the higher brain death theory mm -hmm. uh, because consciousness wasn't necessarily uh, localized to the so-called higher brain, uh, but seemed to uh, require uh, more the core of the brain. So now we're getting down to uh, consciousness involving uh, a lot of the same structures that help to integrate the body. Right. Uh, so not exactly the same, of course, because lower, lower medulla does a lot of uh, visceral integrating functions and doesn't really participate in consciousness. But, but my locus of, of consciousness was moving downward at that time. Right. Um, the other thing that uh, jarred me about these kids was that this, this doctrine about cortex and consciousness was so ingrained in neurology that it was considered you know, just a, an obvious fact, yet I now had clinical evidence that it was wrong. How so, did your colleagues react to those cases? Uh, with amazement. Okay. And did, 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 did these cases uh, come about because technology allowed these kids to survive or you know, neonatal or no? Or had they been present for, for decades or? What allowed them to survive was uh, a loving adoptive mother. Okay. Uh, who gave them lots of stimulation rather than put them in a corner because they were predicted to be a vegetable. Okay. All right. Very good. <laughs> so there was, there was um, um, so perhaps a, a, a social custom um, up until then that would treat these kids in a certain way would be self, you know, would self fulfill the prophecy that they were dead essentially or. I mean, they would not survive, you know, typically they'd be placed well, in... in yeah, uh, it, it, it wasn't that nobody considered them dead except the, I guess, the higher brain death. Right. Uh, but nobody else considered them dead, but they considered them in a permanent vegetative state. And then by virtue of lack of stimulation, then they would actually fulfill that role of exactly. being in a... Okay, all right. Exactly. Okay. okay. So, so it, it was a self-fulfilling thing. Right. And these kids disproved it. Mm -hmm. So, so that uh, kind of gave me grounds for becoming skeptical about uh, hard and fast medical dogmas in general. And we know from the history of medicine how many uh, <laughs> facts turned out to be errors and how many uh, accepted treatments turned out to be poisons? And so sure, sure. Um, so, 
so it, it kind of opened my mind uh, a bit also towards the brain death question and made me more receptive to the critics of brain death who were writing at that time. Um, one thing that came out of the uh, 1989 Pontifical Academy of Sciences meeting where I defended brain death as death, um, some of the other defenders there uh, referred to uh, the fact that these cases cannot live more than, or live, cannot be, cannot survive more than a few days at most, despite the most heroic treatments. And I knew that this was not the case because by that time there had already been a number of publications of prolonged survivors in brain death, um, especially pregnant women who were being kept uh, going in order to bring the fetus to viability. Mm -hmm. And some of these went on for months and then after the baby was delivered by a C-section, then they would withdraw care. So who knows how long they could have lasted if they hadn't withdrawn care. Right. Um, but people at this meeting, experts in neurology, were still citing the president's commission uh, claim that these patients can't be, uh, can't continue more than a few days despite uh, the most intensive care. So um, I corrected some of those uh, comments, but it disturbed me that there were, there were arguments being made in favor of brain death based on this incorrect clinical information. Mm -hmm. So, I guess the, the next thing that uh, happened, which really was the, uh, the coup de grace for brain death for me, was in 1992, when I was consulted on a case of a 14-year-old boy who had become brain dead from head trauma. And he had an isoelectric EEG and he fulfilled the criteria at the time. But his parents refused to uh, allow discontinuation of support. And the attending neurosurgeon didn't want to get in a battle with the parents over this, uh, not least of the reasons being that they were members of a motorcycle gang. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't want to uh, have any trouble from that. Uh, but also, he was convinced that after all, everyone knows that these patients uh, will succumb to cardiac arrest in a few days anyway. So why bother to argue with the parents? We'll just wait for him to have a cardiac arrest and then they'll accept that he's dead. Well, uh, of course, he didn't have a cardiac arrest and time went on, time went on. He actually found, uh, well, not he, but the uh, social workers found a long-term care facility that would take ventilators. And he was transferred to this facility on a ventilator with the diagnosis of brain death. And uh, amazingly, Medi-Cal paid for that. And the staff at this facility were very confused because they had never received a legally dead patient before right. to care for. And so I was consulted because I already had a reputation of being an expert in this area. And I, I flew up and examined him. And uh, apart from being comatose, 
uh, he was perfectly healthy. So he had no signs of skin breakdown. Um, he was being fed by a gastrostomy tube. Uh, right. He had a gastrostomy. Um, and all his organ systems were functioning fine. And while brain dead, he had begun puberty. Okay. And, and I suppose just uh, to be clear here that you, you repeated the, the, the tests to determine brain death. Well, I examined and, him at, right. at a long-term care facility. I mean, okay. they don't have EEG machines and stuff. So, but he fulfilled the clinical criteria. All right. Uh, I didn't repeat an apnea test. Okay. Uh, but one had been documented at his original hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, his father asked me, uh, how can he, how, how can a corpse undergo puberty? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and I thought that was, also, I also thought that was a good question and I had no good answer for him. I, I tried to convince them that, uh, yeah, not, not insisting that he was dead, but uh, that he wouldn't come out of this. Uh, and tried to encourage them to authorize withdrawal of support, but um, they, they wouldn't authorize it. And so I, I went back home uh, very perplexed by this because uh, it seemed to go against all of the dogmas about the brain being the integrator of the body and about the body being a corpse that the ventilator was somehow masking. Um, so none of this made any sense anymore in light of that case. And then uh, the analogy with spinal cord transection occurred to me one day. Because if the brain is really the master integrator of the body, then the body should disintegrate upon losing that coordination from the brain, regardless of why it lost that coordination. So if the brain is destroyed, of course, it will lose that coordination. But if the brain is disconnected from the rest of the body, it will also lose that coordination. And it occurred to me that cases uh, like very severe Guillain-Barre, uh, where there's a locked in and locked out syndrome that can go on for weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain has, uh, the brain is fine, but it's uh, all the nerve signals coming out of the brain and coming out of the spinal cord uh, are, are absent. Uh, yet these, these patients are not dead. They're, they're treated in ICUs until they, improve from their Guillain-Barre syndrome, and that can take weeks. Uh, so their body had not disintegrated during the time of lack of brain integration. Right. Um, so then I thought about high, high spinal cord injury, the same kind of thing. It would uh, disconnect uh, the brain's overseeing function of the body. apart from the vagus nerve, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes these patients are treated with atropine to suppress vagus nerve function because it's uh, imbalanced. Right. So you could imagine someone with high spinal cord transection treated with atropine to suppress vagus nerves. So then now the brain is completely disconnected. Right. Except for the pituitary. Right. Um, but now many patients with brain death uh, have intact uh, posterior pituitary function. So that part of the analogy uh, 
works. Uh, or you could say, suppose that this patient who suffered the spinal cord injury happened to be an endocrinology patient with panhypopituitarism who was on uh, hormone replacement and then uh, incidentally suffered this high spinal cord injury. So now you have a situation that's exactly analogous to brain death. Right. Uh, yet, obviously, these are, are living patients and their bodies don't disintegrate and nobody considers them uh, dead bodies with conscious minds, but uh, they're whole but disabled patients. Uh, so I thought, wow, let me run to the literature on spinal cord injury and see what kind of, of um, clinical manifestations that has in the acute stage. And I was amazed that if you take a chapter on the intensive care of acute high spinal cord injury, and you take a chapter from the intensive care of brain dead organ donors, all the complications are identical. Mm -hmm. And all the management is essentially identical. So that reinforced the validity of this analogy with high spinal cord transection. Um, so with that, uh, I had to admit that uh, brain death wasn't death after all, but was indeed an irreversible coma, as the Harvard committee said. Uh, and uh, this justification based on, on um, integration of the organism just didn't hold water. Right. You, um, th there's one case that you, you know, comes up when, when people talk about your work, um, um, is the case of TK. Yes. Um, I, can you, can you, um, just briefly describe it? Cause it's, it's quite remarkable. It's probably the most striking, uh, of all these cases. Right. Well, uh, this was 1992 when I had this insight. So I started collecting cases of prolonged survival in the state of brain death. Mm -hmm. And I did uh, extensive literature search and newspaper searches and, and legal case searches and every, everywhere I could uh, find a case of prolonged survival and brain death. And a colleague brought to my attention uh, the case of TK because he had actually been involved in TK's care uh, some years before. Uh, TK uh, had become brain dead at age four from uh, bacterial meningitis. And there was no question that he was brain dead. I mean, he had multiple isoelectric EEGs. Uh, he was ventilator dependent. Uh, he eventually had an MRI scan that showed no brain structure inside the head. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, back at that time when he had this uh, meningitis, he was four years old and the diagnostic guidelines for children hadn't come out yet. So working off the president's commission guidelines, it said you, you cannot diagnose brain death in under age five. Okay. So his physicians, uh, while sure that he was brain dead, didn't declare him so because there weren't any accepted diagnostic guidelines at that time. Mm -hmm. So, and his parents wanted him fully supported. So they did support him. And um, eventually he was discharged home 
So he went from the ICU to the regular peds ward uh, and then to a rehab. They, they had the, law, the hardest time finding a rehab place that would take him. Right. Eventually they did. And then after that, he went home. On a home ventilator. On a home ventilator. Right. And uh, I made contact with the mother through this, this other physician. And uh, I got invited out to his home and examined him. And uh, he still feel, fulfilled all the clinical criteria. I didn't do an apnea test, of course, not in the home. Uh, but he fulfilled all the other criteria. <clears throat> and um, so he continued in the state for 20 and a half years. 20 and a half years. Right. So I saw him uh, 14 years into it, mm -hmm. and he he survived another seven years after that. Um, he died of pneumonia, if I recall, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, or or is that, is that not clear? It was never entirely clear from what. Okay. Um, but then the, there was... Uh, but he didn't have a brain-only autopsy. Right. So there was an autopsy that showed, I mean, absence of brain structure or matter or uh, is liquefied or... The remnant of the brain was just a hard calcified mass that the pathologist had a very hard time even removing from the skull. Okay. And, uh, so, so there's no way people could, um, could invoke uh, misdiagnosis. Okay. No, non-microscopic, there was not one neuron. That right. Could... So he, he was certainly brain dead. And uh, yet he survived in that condition for 20 and a half years. So, um, but he was not the only one. Uh, I, I came across a total of 175 cases that had been published as of 1998. Okay. And there was enough information about 56 of them to do a meta-analysis, which I did. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that the, uh, there were two factors that influenced the survival potential in the state of brain death. One was the cause of the brain death. So intrinsic brain pathology, longer survival potential than multi-system injury. Okay. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. So for example, a gunshot wound to the head or a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage uh, have much longer survival potential than someone in a car accident with massive chest injuries and massive head injuries and right. massive everything injuries. Uh, so that was one factor. The other was age. So it turned out that uh, younger age, especially children, had longer survival potential than older patients, which also makes sense because their bodies are more resilient in general. So that, that paper was published in 1998 in the Journal of Neurology. And uh, I didn't know how it would be received. It was the, the process of getting it uh, peer reviewed and published was really interesting because the editor uh, actually told me that he thought I was preaching to the choir that everybody knew this. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and not, not uh, totally unsurprising, uh, I must say, but uh, interesting nevertheless. So... And then, then one of the uh, great uh, defenders of brain death uh, at that time, Ron Cranford, was invited to write an editorial about my paper which was the lead article in that issue of the journal. And uh, 
uh, he entitled it, how did it go? Um, e even the brain dead can be healthy, right? something like that. Mm -hmm. Even even the dead can be healthy. <laughs> so, some, <laughs> uh, some bits, right. And uh, and and he was uh, also very interested in this phenomenon of prolonged brain death. And a, a couple of the cases of children I actually got from him. Uh, so so with that endorsement and uh, being selected as the, the lead article in the journal, it, it had a good deal of, of uh, prestige and, and validity. Uh, some people criticized the methodology, uh, questioning whether all of these cases were really brain dead and, and not misdiagnoses. Um, yeah, but you agree, I mean, it, all it takes is one. All it takes is the TK case, yes, exactly, uh, uh, to to disprove the the rationale to begin with, right? Right, right. So so that that got me started down this new path of going from uh, advocate of brain death to critic of brain death. All right, and um, um, it, it seems, at least to me, that. Um, while on the one hand being uh, acknowledged for your contributions, um, you've been, <laughs> it seems, isolated. Um, so people pay their due respect and they say, yes, that's interesting, but business goes on as usual, right? It's, um, is, that a, is that a fair? Uh... Well, uh, yes and no. Okay. So I would say there, there are two kinds of reaction to this work. Um, on the part of clinicians, um, they tend to be pragmatic. They're required to follow the JACO guidelines and the, uh, every other kind of guideline. And, uh, of course, there's uh, great support for organ transplantation. So there's a, an incentive not to rock the boat among clinicians. Right. Uh, so I'd say by and large, clinicians are either unaware of my work, uh, or if they're aware of it, um, don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Right. Uh, on the other side are the bioethicists and the philosophers. And I'd, I'd have to say that my work has made a big impact uh, in that field. Correct. I think uh, a second presidential commission was uh, convened, and, and, and I would say that it was convened primarily to respond to your findings in 2008 is that would you say that's the case or well i uh, maybe, maybe not entirely but because it addressed uh, different questions related to brain death but right. but I, certainly I, it felt the need to re re-examine the original rationale um used it was it was it had become clear that the original rationale of of 1981 didn't work anymore Right. And it's the rationale that's behind uh, what is known as the UDDA, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which is a federal act that essentially uh, sanctions the de determination of brain death in, in all 50 states and, and try to harmonize. Although the, the criteria, each state have, will have its own uh, criteria, uh, but nevertheless, something akin to brain death is accepted in, in all 50 states. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say criteria, but statutory definition. Right, 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 right. Um, but um, what was I going to say? Um, uh, the, the bioethicist oh, responding oh, yeah. to, right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and I, I want to make the point that uh, I'm not the only one who is feeding this drum. Right. So um, 
with the passage of time since since I began publishing about this, uh, more and more uh, thinkers, uh, philosophers, and bioethicists especially, have joined in and started uh, adding their own critiques of, of the rationales for brain death. So um, now there's a, there's a fairly substantial uh, group of people who, who have been publishing and criticizing the concept of brain death. So I'm, I'm by no means a, uh, a lone wolf here. No, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, where it should matter, which is in the clinical uh, arena, uh, you've been contained, or the whole, you know, anti-brain death movement, including you, you know, so far has been relatively contained. Um, and it may not be for long. I mean, I think uh, the events and, and, and I, would, uh, I would say reality is catching up with... Uh, <laughs> With, with, with the narrative. Um, just recently, I think maybe it was a year or two ago, The New Yorker ran a long piece uh, on brain death. You were, you were quoted in there. Yes. Uh, the case of Jahai McMath that I mentioned in the, uh, you know, early in, in the introduction, um, you know, has, has uh, garnered quite a bit of attention. Um, I, I suspect um, that, you know, the, things will have to, to move one way or another. I'm not sure how, but, uh, but I suspect, um, I, I suspect first that the public will, you know, uh, will recognize more and more that, um, that there's uncertainty, uh, at least, uh, about brain death. And cases like Jahai McMath will, will multiply. What do you think? Well, I, I think Jahai McMath, um, doesn't challenge the concept of brain death, but rather the diagnostic criteria for brain death. Okay. So uh, regarding the, the concept, uh, I, I just wanted to add that uh, this past April, there was a, uh, a big conference at Harvard University Medical School. Right, I put a link to that. I, you know, I put a link to, uh, your key papers, and I'll put a link to to this conference, and uh, and I think there was a, a YouTube video um, of a seminar in which you participated. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So of course, uh, the, the occasion of the conference was the 50th anniversary of the Harvard Committee Report. Right. In 1968. So it was fitting that this take place at Harvard, and uh, so. Uh, obviously, every possible opinion about brain death was expressed uh, at this meeting. Uh, there, there was no consensus whatsoever about it, no conclusion of the meeting as a whole. Uh, but I, I was impressed by the respect that was given to the position arguing that brain death is not death. Mm -hmm. And, and I dare say that uh, 20 years ago, uh, that position would not have had nearly that degree of respect at such a meeting. Right. Um, I, I, do you, would you, would you say that uh, the other main alternative argument for brain death, the personhood argument has uh, taken primacy now in among people who defend brain death? Yes, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't so prominent at the Harvard meeting. Okay. But in general, if you talk to people casually about brain death and why they think brain death is death, uh, you'll get some variant of the personhood argument. Right. You know, that's right. It, um, interestingly, about a year ago or, or so, I was asked to, to do a cardiac catheterization uh, on, on a patient who had been declared brain, death, brain dead. And at first, I was a little bit reluctant to, to, to do this, you know, since I don't, you know, I don't want to sort of condone or, or put my, you know, rubber stamp the, the diagnosis. On the other hand, I thought that if I, if I made a fuss about it, it probably wouldn't go very far. And, and, uh, but what I did, I wanted to, I asked the, um, the transplant coordinator, a, a very lovely woman who was there, you know, um, um, what, how she, 
how she phrased, you know, first of all, I asked her if she was aware of the controversies, of she, she was aware of your work and so forth. And, and she said, yes, she was aware of it. And then I asked her, to, how, how do you, uh, what's your conversation with the family? What do you tell the family? And there, there was a lot of equivocation mm-hmm. about what they tell the family nowadays. Sure. It's like, he's, he's legally dead. He's, you know, I mean, so now they have 15, 15 different definitions of death that, they, you know, one can choose from. It, it used to be that the, the two certainties were death and taxes. And now the only two certainty seems to be this taxes where we're left with taxes. So, so <laughs> death is no longer certain. <laughs> um, but so, um, so, so, so yes, uh, now the, the, there's going to be some uh, more, more conversation. I, mean, I thought it was remarkable that there would be a whole piece in The New Yorker on this question. But I want to go back to the Jahai McMath where you said that the main question with, uh, you know, Jahai McMath challenges the diagnostic criteria. And that's because at the time um, of her accident, she, you know, big authorities, neurologic, you know, academic authorities examined her and certified her multiple times as brain dead, meaning that she had met all the possible criteria for brain death. Yet she she went on to survive another three or four years, four years, I think. Um, But what does that mean that it challenges the diagnostic criteria? What other criteria could one come up with uh, to add on to the current armamentarium of criteria? Well, um, Jahai is not another kind of case like TK. Right, true. Uh, there was still brain structure on the MRI, visible brain structure on the MRI. If she was just another TK, then she wouldn't be challenging the diagnostic criteria. Mm-hmm. And so she would just be one more in this collection of chronic brain death cases that, that uh, challenge the concept. Right. Uh, but she's not one more of these, actually, um, because um, after several months, her family started to suspect that she was responsive to commands. Right. And of course I was following this in the newspapers and I didn't give much importance to to that claim of the family because we all have seen families that are in denial and interpret reflexes as meaningful responses. Right. Um, but then they started to make some videos of these because they knew nobody would believe them. Mm -hmm. And because of my interest and reputation in this field, uh, I got in touch with them through their lawyer and and, um, established a rapport. And they started sending me these videos. And uh, I was shocked by the the kind of movements that Jahai made in response to commands. Right. So and you show those talking. videos on the at the at the Harvard meeting, and I will I will put a link to that video. Where? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so they're not the kind of movement that occurs in patients with high spinal cord transection. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're not any of the known repertoire of autonomous spinal movements. Right and they're anatomically specific. So when they say move your right arm, her right arm moves. Move your left arm and the left arm moves. Yeah, quite remarkable. Very remarkable. And so this, uh, it convinced me that she did not actually fulfill anymore the first cardinal criterion of brain death, namely unresponsiveness. Well, right. she, did, she did it at the time that she was diagnosed back in December 2013, of course, but no longer. So what this means is that um, her lack of brain activity was reversible. Mm-hmm. 
So in, in a way, the definition of brain death uh, requires irreversible cessation. Right, right. So in a way, she's in the category of cases that are perhaps a little bit easier to dismiss, but they're not all that infrequent. And you see them in the newspapers of kids uh, on, 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 on the way to organ harvesting, you know, wakes up and they have to cancel the, the harvest. And, and now the kid is uh, out of the hospital. You know, people who are declared brain death um, subsequent to a trauma and so forth and, and somehow reverse. But the difference here is that the reversal came years later or months later. Months later. Whereas in these, in these other cases, it's typically short term. So we, we blame the, the neurology team for being too hasty or the, or the, the treating team or the, the harvesting team for being too hasty um, in, in their... The problem with those uh, reports is that uh, essentially none of them has been medically documented. They're all anecdotes in newspapers, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And uh, right. a, couple them, a couple of them I've tried to uh, investigate myself and they can't get anywhere. I mean, but are, aren't there, aren't there uh, medical records that uh, conceivably could be examined? Uh, of course there are medical records, but no one will share them. I see. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so these cases just remain newspaper anecdotes. So right. we don't really know whether they fulfilled the, all the American Academy of Neurology criteria or not. Right, right. But Jahai certainly did, and that's why her okay. case is really important. There's no question that she fulfilled the criteria. And, uh, and this uh, recovery of some brain function uh, didn't occur right away. It, it took months mm -hmm. to manifest. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, to me, uh, seems to be the, the first indirect proof of the phenomenon of global ischemic penumbra, which was proposed by the Brazilian neurologist Cicero Coimbra back in 1998. Right. Uh, ischemic penumbra is well known in the stroke field. Uh, you know, when you have a stroke, there's a necrotic core, and then surrounding that is a donut shaped area of decreased blood flow, uh, which is, uh, is just marginally viable tissue. Mm -hmm. It's not functioning, but there's just enough blood flow to prevent it from becoming necrotic. And that's called the ischemic penumbra. Right. The goal of stroke therapy is to salvage the ischemic penumbra and, mm -hmm. and prevent it from becoming necrotic. So, uh, if you if you think of the pathophysiology of brain death going from normal intracerebral blood flow down to no intracerebral blood flow, it it has to go through mathematically. It has to go through the range of ischemic penumbra. Mm -hmm. Now, while it's in the range of ischemic penumbra, there will be no brain function. But in principle, uh, it's reversible because the brain tissue isn't yet necrotic. Right. Uh, so Coimbra hypothesized that this happens and that somebody in the ischemic penumbra would fulfill all the diagnostic criteria for brain death. Right. Uh, and be essentially indistinguishable from it, yet not be irreversibly in that state. Okay. So this is the first documented case. So uh, it's, it's the first case that I think can only be understood uh, in, this, in this way. Right, right, right. Um, and to support that, uh, she had an MRI scan done around nine months out, which showed uh, remarkable preservation of a lot of the gross brain structures. Mm -hmm. So her whole brain was not liquefied like TKs and like some of the others that I've studied. Right. Um, 
Of course, it, it was far from normal. And there was a big lesion in her brainstem, which uh, certainly accounts for her lack of brainstem reflexes and apnea. But her, her uh, cortex and, and basal ganglia uh, had amazing gross preservation. There was massive demyelination. So no question that you know, she would be severely, severely disabled from this, but her brain was not liquefied. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a, a seeming structural basis for this intermittent responsiveness that she demonstrated. Right. And um, I, I thought it was interesting, but perhaps you can correct me if I, if I um, drew the wrong conclusion. Um, at that meeting, at the end of the, the series of talk, uh, Professor Truog gives his, now he's a, um, he seems to have accepted the, the, the problem with the brain as integrator um, rationale, right? Well, no, he doesn't uh, accept that at all. He doesn't accept it? No, I'm he sorry, he, it's rejected. No, he, he totally rejects that. Right, right, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I misspoke, I misspoke. But he gave, he had a diagram at the very end where he spoke of a um, sort of a, a seamless transition between different uh, brain, st brain states going into death. And so where you have normal brain function and then you have persistent vegetative state and then brain death and then death. Uh, I don't know if you recall this, this diagram. Yes. Um, but it, it seems to me that um, the case of Jahai McMath uh, seems to contradict that the possibility of having sort of a gradual transition from one to the next because she would well, have... Such, such a diagram is... Uh... At a moment in time, I suppose. And Jahai McMath's case shows the evolution over time. Right. But she jumped from one category to the next. Or, she, well, she doesn't have any of the features of a persistent vegetative state, although no, she, she, she never did. So she skipped that stage, if you will. You know, if, if we're going to accept that her movements, not, you know, at the time that they were recorded were uh, volitional and conscious, then she went from one stage to the next. So without going through a stage of a persistent vegetative state because she never had control of her uh, brainstem and, and that sort of thing. Correct. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a minor point. I don't want to uh, dwell too much on this, but. She, she went from coma to what, uh, what I think would fulfill the definition of minimally conscious. State. Right, right, right. Um, it's it's a you know obviously extremely important and again I, I I'm I'm hoping that the uh, the clinicians will gain more interest uh, uh, on on this uh, this question I mean it seems so fundamental uh, it is philosophical and it um, you know it, it's it's not necessarily um, um, uh, an obvious or an easy question to to resolve. Um, uh, I, I'm certainly sold on, on the critique of brain death. Um, what, uh, any prediction as to what will happen in the next uh, few months or few years? Uh, so, so there's more embrace of your, your, the critique, but it's still business as usual as far as clinical medicine is concerned. I think it'll be business as usual for a long time. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but there is this, this growing disconnect between... Uh, the business as usual and the theory that supports the business as usual and and at some point it's just going to have to fall apart right right i do want to say something and i'm not sure i mean i don't i don't have an answer to it but my, my main concern uh, um here um is about the um what 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 we're saying is the case as doctors when we say you know this person is dead or not dead of course, whatever we say has ramification on what happens to to that person, whether it's allowable to harvest organs or not. I mean, if somebody is, let's say that we abandon the concept of brain death and somebody has an irreversible coma, um, 
right now the law in theory prevents the harvesting of organs unless death is declared so if we abandon the, the diagnosis, you know, if we abandon this, this um, brain death criteria and, and not declare these patients dead, um, it seems to me that clearly that would jeopardize um, the, the, the current way of, of harvesting. But I wanna say that that's, it's a separate question that has its own, um, you know, requires its own you know, philosophy and reflection and so forth, that it's not necessarily a given that, you know, if we abandon A, we have to abandon B. Um, so I just want, wanted to make that point. Um, I don't think it would be easy to, to continue to justify uh, doing harvesting the way we do it, but, but it certainly is a different, a distinct question. Right, and then there's this whole other approach to, to uh, organ retrieval, which is the, the non-heart beating donor. Right, right. So, so there are many, you know, different, you know, uh, there are ramifications, there are many different possibilities, and it's a, it's a whole new can of worms. <laughs> um, but, but the main question here is, is the question. Prediction. I'll make a prediction. All right. Um, with the passage of some years, when they have perfected uh, growing synthetic organs from stem cells and so on, uh, or from genetically modified animals, um, then the whole construct of brain death will disappear. I agree. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think that we, and then people will say, of course, we never believed that. <laughs> we, we knew they were not dead and that sort of thing. No, I, I think you're right. And, and hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. Um, and I, I think there's, there are many promising developments uh, on that front. Yeah. On that hopeful note, uh, uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Schumann, any final words or anything else we, we didn't touch on that you think uh, would be helpful for the audience to know about? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I think that the case of Jahai and other families uh, in the last few years that have also been in the news uh, opposing the withdrawal of care from their child who was diagnosed brain dead, um, I, I think Jahai's case uh, gives us reason to respect these families more than we tend to do. That's a, a very good point. Um, we, we may not agree with their decision. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily agree with, with that uh, kind of uh, vitalism, if you want to call it, of keeping someone going at all costs, no matter what. Right, I agree. So uh, that's not my position, but I think I, I must respect the sincerely held uh, values of my patients and my patients' families, uh, and, and not hammer them over the head with the law that says they're dead. Yeah. That's an excellent point, um, uh, Alan, because for people who, who did not follow the case at the time, uh, the comments were really quite nasty directed at the family for wanting to keep uh, Jahai alive uh, and on the ventilator. So, and, and many coming from the medical community. Yes. Um, so that's, that's an excellent point. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And, and now with, with this evidence that has come out that she actually was not brain dead all along, uh, but that the standard criteria are incapable of distinguishing global ischemic penumbra from true brain death. Um, I think if, if a family insists on continuing support, I think they ought to be respected. Right. Very good. It was, uh, it's been a real terrific pleasure, extremely informative um, for me, I'm sure for the audience as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to talk about here and perhaps, you know, we can revisit at some point down the line, especially if there's a new development or a new striking case. I would love to, to bring you back to discuss it with, uh, uh, with us here. I'd be happy to. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Bye.